Hi there. I'm Rebecca Arbogast, head of global public policy for Comcast, uh, NBC Universal, and I am very happy to introduce Susan Del Benny, who represents uh, the first district of Washington State, which is, as many of you know, a, a hub of technology leadership, and uh, where I have where I have uh, had many a fine hike. So I, I recommend that. Uh, Congresswoman Del Benny is a strong advocate for forward-looking policies that give people access to opportunity, that promote innovation, and that drive economic growth. I know that all three have become so overstated, we almost just don't hear them anymore, but it's important to recognize how fundamental they are to healing and growing this country. She lends a unique voice on tech policy, having been a very accomplished tech entrepreneur and leader as one of a handful of women in the executive level at Microsoft, as a member of the founding team of Drugstore.com, and as CEO and president of Nimble Technology. And near and dear to the Internet, Internet Education Foundation, which is what puts on State of the Net, she hosted the Congressional App Challenge, which is one of our programs to encourage high school students to learn to code. So it's my pleasure to welcome Congresswoman Susan Del Benny. Good afternoon. Um, it's uh, it's starting to snow out there. It's a pretty amazing. Uh, th thank you, Rebecca. It's great to be here with everyone at um, this year's State of the Net conference. And I guess I should say a happy belated Data Privacy Day um, for all of you who know that yesterday was Data Privacy Day. Um, not necessarily something that's on everyone's radar, but a very important issue that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I did spend most of my career in technology, working in technology, and I've definitely seen the transformative power of the internet. Um, when I worked on Windows 95, I guess that dates me right there by just uh, saying that. Um, less than 1% of the world's population used what we kind of thought of as the internet as much as um, um, it was available to folks. Today, that number's jumped to over 40% or more than 3.8 billion people around the world. So this explosion of internet users has fundamentally changed all aspects of our life. Um, and in, in many ways, a very positive um, changes. You know, over 50 years ago, Robert Kennedy gave a speech in Cape Town, South Africa. It's called the Ripples of Hope speech. And in that, he said, the first element of individual liberty is the freedom of speech. Hand in hand with the freedom of speech goes the power to be heard, to share in the decision of government which shape men's lives, um, end quote. So from Cape Town to Seattle, um, the internet has definitely given voice to millions of people and helped connect them to different cultures around the world. But now we're increasingly seeing some of the negative impacts of the internet, um, specifically when it comes to social media and information. Uh, too often we see stories about how social media platforms have been used to promote conspiracy theories and spread hateful ideology. Um, and as evidenced by the 2016 US election, by Brexit and elections in France and Germany, the internet and social media have been used to spread disinformation. When companies fail to protect an individual's data or sell that data to private companies, people can be targeted by unsavory groups looking to spread disinformation. And this is more evidence that we need to update our laws to reflect the challenges that we face in the 21st century. So right now, many of you know, um, we our law on the books when we talk about online communications um, is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act um, dated back in 1986. Um, that's years before email became mainstream. Um, I worked on email, my first job at Microsoft starting in 1989. Um, and when, um, and back then, Mark Zuckerberg was only two years old. So it also means that digital information isn't treated the same as physical information, um, like a paper document in your drawer, um, when we look at the way we um, talk about issues of privacy. We still don't have Fourth Amendment protections for all digital information, a warrant standard in particular. So the House of Representatives has passed um, legislation last Congress, again, the Email Privacy Act. However, the Senate failed to act. And I bring this up because this should be something very simple to make sure that your digital information is treated the sa same way as a piece of paper in your file drawer. 
And we haven't passed that yet. And I highlight that because when we talk about the deeper issues of privacy, um, as things start to get more complicated, we need to be able to move forward. And we need, if we can't move forward on email privacy, it's gonna be a lot harder to move forward on other areas. So passing the Email Privacy Act is not enough, but it will be an important first step. Americans are spending roughly 24 hours per week online, and a quarter of people say they spend almost all of their time on the internet, um, are constantly on. Um, knowing this, we have a responsibility to ensure that consumers have a clear, and I think clear is an important word here, a clear understanding of what happens to their data, and to ensure that companies aren't taking advantage of innocent people's most sensitive information. So that's why last Congress, um, I introduced legislation that would change the way consumers' personal private information is collected. Um, the legislation would help people by ensuring all users are presented with companies' privacy policies in plain English, um, something that people can understand. And because as we know, when a screen pops up with, um, on a website with a very long piece of complicated language, um, it's easier for consumer, consumers to just click okay or I agree without really knowing what they're agreeing to. So the legislation that I proposed would require companies to allow users to opt in. So opt in would be, um, um, required for people to use information um, before they can um, use that information in ways that the public um, may not understand unless they've been given um, a information from the company on how it be used. So they must disclose um, with whom they plan on sharing any information and for what purposes that information will be used. Um, they would have to go undergo privacy audits by a neutral third party on an annual basis, and there would be consequences for companies that don't comply. The Federal Trade Communication, the FTC, would have rulemaking authority, and states' attorneys general would have power to um, pursue those not in compliance with the legislation. Now, these are bold yet also simple actions that need to be taken. Um, because we've seen what happens. P people's information has been stolen, it's been used without their knowledge, um, and we're behind. We're behind from a co congressional level, but we're behind as a country in terms of taking action on this issue. Too much is at stake, including our democracy, and it requires that we turn our ideas and our talk into actual legislation. So pontificating about the virtues of data protection isn't enough. We need to act, and that's why I put forward um, my proposal. Um, the sense of urgency to pass something is, is only heightened when you consider the fact that the rest of the world is not standing still on this issue. I, I'm a member of the Ways and Means Committee, and I've seen how quickly consumer privacy has become a global issue. And just in the last year alone, some countries have adopted laws that are less than ideal. Um, India is considering a draft data protection bill that calls for strict data localization measures. Brazil is also considering comprehensive data protection legislation that contains similar localization measures. Meanwhile, despite their recent decision to participate in the e-commerce dialogue at the WTO, China's internet regime re remains restrictive and discriminatory. And through initiatives like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and One Belt, One Road initiative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, China is aggressively working to shape the global trading system in its own image. Though perhaps the most significant global development of the last year has been um, the EU's general data privacy regulation, which has gone into effect. Um, and since GDPR has gone into effect, the Europeans have not been shy about their desire to have GDPR set global standards for data protection. Just last week, the European Commission announced that it adopted an adequacy de decision on Japan, crediting the world's largest area of safe data flow. Um, the Commissioner for Justice, Commissioner um, Jourova, stated, quote, investing in privacy pays off. This arrangement will serve as an example of future partnerships in this key area and help to set global standards. Um, additionally, Prime Minister Abe said that a main focus of Japan's chairmanship for the G20 this year would be worldwide data governance. 
So while there are parts of my consumer privacy proposal that would bring the U.S. into harmony with GDPR, it also avoids the parts of that regulation that could stifle innovation and potentially put the U.S. startup community at a competitive disadvantage. So we need to drive this effort to set global norms before someone else sets them for us. And we're falling behind. So Congress needs to make this a priority, this Congress. And this is something that absolutely should be a bipartisan effort. Um, other countries aren't the only ones forging ahead with new privacy regimes. Now some states have grown impatient with the lack of movement here in Washington, D.C. Um, and so they're moving on their own. Uh, many of you know, last year California passed its own data privacy law. And now la lawmakers in my home state of Washington are also pushing um, a data privacy law, state data privacy law. Um, I applaud that work and the states were taking initiative to pass these important laws. But if we're not careful, we do risk creating a situation where we create digital borders, not just internationally, but also within the United States. And this balkanization of the internet could cause massive disruptions in digital supply chains and digital trade at a time where digital flows have a larger impact on global GDP growth than trade and traditional goods. So while there's no doubt that we have some serious challenges that need to address, be addressed, I definitely believe that we are up to the task. It's possible to create a successful and enduring regulatory framework for the digital economy that balances consumer privacy with the private sector's ability to innovate. Um, but this can only be achieved with buy-in from the private sector and making sure that the United States continues to attract the best talent from across the globe. Six years ago on this day, um, President Obama delivered a speech on comprehensive immigration reform where he said, quote, after all, Immigrants helped start businesses like Google and Yahoo. They created entire new industries and in turn created new jobs and new prosperity for our citizens. In recent years, one in four high tech startups in America were founded by immigrants. So as we continue to talk about a new regulatory framework for the digital economy and making investments necessary to maintain America's technological advantage, our conversations must include a push for comprehensive immigration reform. So in the coming months, I look forward to working um, with people from this room to make sure that we can pass and move forward on consumer privacy legislation that can set global standards and preserve the principles of a free and open internet. So thank you so much for having me and for all of the work we're doing to continue to make sure we have a strong internet economy and a strong internet for everyone around the world. Um, now I, I'm looking, um, sure. Time for questions because I was supposed to the next, the, inter, introduce the next person who is not here yet. So we'll, uh, we'll do some questions. And um, I couldn't tell with the light whether or not um, she was here yet, so. So you, that's fine. I don't think you're we are we are filibustering, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway. I don't, I don't think he's going to be. So you just take a few questions, and then I think we're gonna, we, we don't have to introduce the next speaker. I'll do that. Oh, okay. I don't think okay. Be um, any questions? I'm sorry, I can't see very well. So if someone else who can see people. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, my name is Laura Lee Kelly. I'm at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown. Uh, my question to you, um, there's been a lot of conversation at this conference about uh, Congress needing to get more up to speed and on the curve of technology and data innovation. Um, I understand that you were recently named to the new Special Select Committee on Modernization with your colleague from Washington, Mr. Go Washington. Kilmer. Yay, Washington, exactly. It's actually the perfect state to do this, um, to lead this effort. So could you say a little bit about that and, and if... Maybe if Congress itself and the members become more brand ambassadors for technology and learn it in their workplace, that that'll impact the ability to make policy as well. Thank you. No, that's a great point. And so we have a, a select committee focused on the modernization of Congress. And that's the information that um, you're talking about that just went out today. I'll be member, one of the members of the committee. Um, my colleague from Washington, Derek Kilmer, um, is the chair. Um, but really, it is about how we modernize Congress. And one area that I will particularly be focused on is how we use technology, or in some cases, maybe how we don't use technology. Uh, if you think of some very simple examples, um, if we have a vote happening on the floor, uh, it's 
not always easy to know how much time left is in a vote. There are things that we can find out if we're looking at a television, but not always as clear um, from an app, for example, on the phone. We still have folks carrying pagers um, to call votes. Uh, and so when we look at just simple things about information and how that's used, those are simple things we can look at. But I think you're right in that if folks are actually using technology, there's a great awareness of some of the opportunities and the challenges. And we should actually be doing a great job setting an example of how we use technology when we look at our legislative process and how people work. So I look forward to, and it's not, the committee is not just focused on technology. That's clearly an area that I'll be focused on, but it's all the ways we can look at um, how we modernize Congress. So I'm excited. We haven't met yet, um, but it, it'll be exciting to move forward on that, on that initiative. And if someone, yeah. Um, well, um, I think this is a, this is a, I always think we should talk about technology as infrastructure. It's foundational. It's not just a, its own separate vertical. And so when you bring up the issue that you're bringing up, I think that is part of making sure that we think of that as infrastructure and how we're consistent across the board. When we look at privacy, we have to look at privacy in many areas, but also when we look at how we um, use and acquire technology in government, whether it's at local state government or the federal government, um, we haven't always implemented technology in, in smart ways. Technology used to be thought of as kind of a a nice to have versus a must have. And so investments weren't always made in technology. And, um, and so many government agencies fell behind. Um, I, you know, I saw this, I ran the Department of Revenue for the state of Washington and saw, you know, we went through a lot of efforts to update our technology because people hadn't made those investments. And when we look at the federal government as well, we have areas, um, I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, the IRS would, you know, be one example where you have huge opportunities. Um, but those are things that also take resources and investment to do them well and do them right, to be thoughtful. And, um, and so how we look at how we, implement that, how we make decisions. There's been a lot of talk about procurement and um, kind of how we go about that in the federal government area. How do we look broadly at issues or do we look at things in such small kind of vertical tranches that we don't realize that a technology can play a role and that maybe interaction um, ability for systems to work with each other will be critically important when you're laying out your specifications for what you wanna do. So we need to dig into all of those areas, and I think um, when we talk about areas of oversight, that's another place that we can play a role. But most fundamentally, we have to make sure that legislators are ed educated. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Internet of Things Caucus. We set that up to help educate legislators on technology, how it works, where it's headed, um, what's there today sometimes, but also what's going to be there in the future, because not everybody is aware, not only about some of the technologies that are being implemented today, but where they're headed. And I definitely feel like best practices is another area where people can, we can pilot things, we can try things, and hopefully what we learn isn't just shared within one agency, but we could shared with many others. So um, we have greater learning, things can move a little bit faster. So there are many, ways to address the issue you bring up, and I think the issue you bring up is highlights that we have a lot of work to do, um, both on the legislative side and understanding where things are going, but also um, um, within, within the administration to make sure our agencies are doing the best they can um, and are up to date. We have a question in the back, if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Wade Burkholder, and I'm a 3L at the University of Nebraska, um, but my question comes as a former internet marketer in regards to your act. Um, so in addition to having plain language contracts, educating consumers, and requiring companies to be more transparent in their language, why is it important to have consumers opt in uh, as far as what information they're going to disclose uh, with companies? Well, I think right now um, there's kind of this, pre you, people have to opt out, but if they don't know what they, how their information might be used in the first place, uh, you're kind of assuming that okay. right off the bat that yeah, you can use data. And I think it's important that people actually get to make that proactive choice. 
Um, so part of that is making sure that we are using plain English so people know and that people are presented with that information and they get to make a conscious decision that they're allowing their information to be used in the way that it's being requested to be used. And, um, and so I think that's kind of a basic element of making sure that consumers are in charge of their own data. Um, there's also a discussion just to kind of just to highlight one of the um, issues that folks have talked about is, you know, truly making sure that we're talking about, you know, private data. There may be publicly available data that is is out there. Um, so we, we need to make sure that people have control of data that is, is their private information and make sure that, um, once again, people are making the decisions for how that's going to be used. I thought someone, yeah. I, that's the one hand I can see right there. Yes, thank you for your excellent remarks. Uh, so my, my question is kind of basic, which is, do you think it's feasible for the U.S. to be number one in the world in, shall we say, technology, broadly speaking, without also being number one when it comes to public education? I'm not just talking about university education. I'm talking about, like, K to 12. And the kind of example I use, I don't know if most people know where AT&T Bell Labs is now, but it belongs to a Finnish company called Nokia. So... Um, well, my husband used to work for Bell Labs back back um, a while ago, uh, and um, one, I absolutely agree. Um, from early learning all the way through, it's important that kids get off to a great start, and if we give them those tools early on, it we know that kids are more successful wherever they're from. And so those investments um, are critically important, and frankly, save us resources because if we try to catch up later when young people haven't had those building blocks early on, it's harder and harder. The success, um, successful outcomes um, start to decline and the number of resources to try to help you know, folks catch up um, become more and more, more and more stringent to deliver. So the, the opportunity I think for all of us is to think about how we approach early learning, how we make sure that um, kids all have access to great tools and resources. My district, the home of Microsoft, um, home of a lot of great technology companies and startups and innovation, you can drive an hour and a half outside of that part of my district to a much more rural part of my district where there's no broadband and you can't get cell service. And I highlight that because if we don't address issues, for example, rural broadband and access, um, you don't have the same opportunities. If kids can't get online, they don't have the same opportunities. Um, if kids have to take tests, you know, we talk about taking um, tests and kids having to go into a local library or some other place to where there is a connection so that they're able to, to do that. That obviously puts up barriers and creates a difference from a community that doesn't have those same barriers. So, these are huge investments, and I think when we are going to talk about, when I talk about technology as infrastructure, um, when we talk about roads and bridges, we've got to make sure broadband and access is there too, or even with great teachers, um, those students still aren't going to have the same opportunities. And I highlight that if in my district, which is in one of the kind of most kind of tech um, dense areas in the world, if you can still be in my district and be in a place where you don't have any access. It highlights the challenges that we face. It's not always folks far away. Um, it's sometimes it's our neighbors right next door. We have another question in the back. I probably can't see you. But Hi, it's Rick Lane. You. How are you? Um, question, as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, the U.S.-Mexico-Canadian Trade Agreement have both an IP chapter dealing with digital technologies as well as a digital chapter. Can you just give us an idea of where the Democrats are or Ways and Means Committee is at this point on the trade agreement and the process and what's, what are the next steps for the House? Um, yeah, I'll give you the best. We're kind of just getting started there now, and because of the shutdown, folks like the ITC were shuttered, so some of the reports and other information um, are delayed. Um, but the next r real step will be the ITC report as well as USTR, which also had furloughs, so is behind um, to put together implementing legislation and to um, move forward with Congress on that. Um, we have a new members on the committee, folks are trying, and new members to Congress who need to be briefed and get up to date on 
all issues of agreement, not just the, um, the digital provisions or the IP provisions. Um, I helped start last Congress and I'm co-chair of the Digital Trade Caucus um, so that we can help highlight these issues and educate members on digital trade because I think that gets forgotten. And as some of the things I mentioned in my talk, um, these are very, very important issues when we talk about issues of privacy and other areas, cross-border data flows, um, data localization. Um, so this is a very important area when we talk about trade um, as well. So the next steps will be um, implementing legislation, draft implementing legislation. There will be conversations around that with members of Congress. And I think then we'll start having a better idea of where folks stand on many issues, not just on the digital issues, but separately we're working hard to help get up to, people up to speed on the digital issues through the Digital Trade Caucus. I'm sorry, you're a, a, you're kind of just a, a vague blur in the very back there to me. Oh. Hi, I used to live in Seattle. Yay! Uh, yay! I miss it. Um, I I'm wondering. Go Seahawks! <laughs> I know. Oh, Next God. year? Yeah, maybe again. <laughs> I remember when they beat the Broncos. Um, Any? I uh, <laughs> I. I'm wondering what what and where all of your trainings and the caucuses and the, the even the legislation is addressing blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies, if at all. Thanks. Um, I probably can't answer that entire question standing here. Um, there has been a, a lot of talk and work, and I know there have been some um, proposed piece of legislation. But in the new Congress, I don't know exactly what will be moving forward. Um, there are clearly different different uh, constituencies, different committees that are also looking into this issue, um, financial services, but, but also others. So it is an important topic. I believe there's a caucus focused specifically on blockchain, but I'm not 100% sure, but I think there is one, and I'd have to get back to you on that too, that might be um, bringing folks together specifically to discuss um, related issues, but another area where it's going to be very important that we bring people together and make sure people have baseline understanding um, so that they can be informed as we look at policy going forward. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, so you're also a new co-chair of the Congressional App Challenge. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, I can't you see you, but I know who's asking that question. <laughs> about why you think um, that competition is important and early childhood STEM education um, is important more generally. Yeah, so um, we kind of were an early adopter of the Congressional App Challenge in my district. Um, one, because I feel passionately about the opportunity of making sure that um, young people learn how to code and that they have avenues where they, that kind of require them to get involved and engaged. Um, as many of you probably know, we have the Congressional Art Competition and every district uh, around the country can bring together high school students and they can submit um, art. There's certain requirements on kind of they have to meet in terms of what they submit, but um, each congressional office um, selects a winner and those winners come out to Washington DC and their, their works are hanging on the, um, the, in the Cannon Tunnel. Um, and so if you walk through there and you see all the artwork there, those are all high school students who won in their different districts the app challenge and, or the art, art competition. And the app challenge was kind of a version of that of what can we do to get, get um, students in our local communities to write applications, um, to give them an incentive to write application to um, sometimes alone, sometimes in teams. Um, so that they would have a reason to learn how to code, to get engaged and involved. And so we've rolled that out throughout our district. Um, and as we've done it every year, it's grown increasingly, increasingly more, more popular. Um, and I think what's exciting about it, we do a hackathon um, kind of with that too, where we bring students together. They can, for the weekend, spend time coding. Um, we have some folks there who they can ask questions of as they're trying to learn how, sometimes it's students who've never, never have no idea, haven't written any code before. And um, other times it's students have a lot of experience and have had a lot of exposure. And sometimes it's a combination of both working together in teams. But, um, and many ideas, we've had folks work on an application to um, help protect pollinators, um, to uh, 
to help teach chemistry, to providing a game on, on um, climate. And so the creativity is there and taking those ideas and thinking how you might use technology to share those ideas. There's always someone who does a homework tracking application. Um, that's kind of, I think every year we've had one of those. But it's a great way for students to think through an idea of what they wanna do and go through the process of writing code, implementing, thinking through user interface and all the things that um, you think about. And then sometimes value, you may not be the coder, you may be the graphic designer and realize how important it is that you have someone who can think about how you interact with something, not just someone who writes the code, which I think is also kind of that interdisciplinary side is, is wonderful. So um, we worked with teachers to help them know that the competition exists, and then the winners from each district, just like in the art competition, um, come to Washington, D.C. and get to demo. Um, and so it's very exciting, and I think um, we'll continue to grow as more and more members start um, start having the competition in their district and as uh, more and more schools and teachers understand that it's there. So um, I'm excited as we do it again this year. How many years is it? Four years, five years, I think, that it's been out there? I can't see you, but I know you know the answer to that question. Five years. I can't see. I know you're trying oh, to show me oh, some hand good. signal over there. But. Oh, um, uh, this was the fifth iteration. This was the fifth one.